I'm just going to run through a total pull of cork and wedge. Um, I really like total pulling. It seems to be something I get asked more and more. And the last two clinics I've done, people have wanted me to go through total and pulling, so I started quickly doing it. I've got a new block out as well, which is designed to uh, set the corking down. Normally you twist the corking on like that over the edge of the anvil. Uh, and it'll leave a real mess in front of your corking. So I've got this new tooling block now. You just put your steel in there, hit parallel with the uh, edge of the amber, edge of the block there, and it twists it on for you without leaving the, the mess that you normally get in front of your heel. Uh, what I've done is I've put some yellow paint on this uh, side of my tooling block because you'll tool, tool through your generally outside branch first, and then when you do your inside branch, you turn it round. So it's quite a good little trick just to uh, put a easily identifiable mark on one side so you know which side you started on and which side you need to be on for your second branch because quite often what will happen is you'll turn your block around the guy that's striking for you'll grab it he'll turn it around for you and it'll end up back in square one so you'll end up with um, a mismatched, mix, mismatched section so what I'm going to do first is put the corking on uh, I'm going to bend over a piece of this 5 8 square which I think is 16 mil square bending over round about quite a lot, uh, inch and a half there, inch and a half in Europe is about 40, 40 millimetres. So I'm just going to bend that to 90 degrees, keeping a real nice sharp edge on there. So I've got that up to 90 degrees now, it's just under at the moment. And now I'm going to put that into the tooling block. I'm going to set that in there first, I'm going to pull it, keep it pulled back all the time so that if I if I don't, I'm going to set that in there, and if I don't, I'll end up putting little steps in there. What happens is you end up with little creases on this edge of your surface. Uh, and over time, as you forge in your shoe, they open up and then there's real big, ugly cracks. And they're very difficult to get hold of. So I'm just going to get another heat on that. Uh, I'm going to get a strong kit just to knock it in for me. And I'm just going to tool it from roughly the halfway point. Starting obviously there, like I said, get that right in so it's flush with the top of the anvil. And then move along there, working with the sledgehammer in the middle of the, the block. And moving the steel back, so I'm going to tool from probably there all the way through to the end. I've been asked by uh, a guy to make him a tooling block like this, so it's set on like that. And the idea of it is um, when you make a corking, once you've got your square block on the end of your steel, you put your corking over the edge of the anvil, rotate it away from the concave section, which is this side, to correspond to the specimen shoe or the foot that you're shoeing for, and then forge it back. And this puts a set on the uh, it sort of twists the corking around, puts a set on it, so that when the shoe is made and that corking's finished, the leading edge of it should be parallel with that line that you can draw between your toe, two toenails. So that line there should be in, uh, parallel with the line that the leading edge of the corking makes. Uh, what happens when you do it over the edge of the anvil, you forge it back there, and because this is a flat surface onto a, a concave section, you end up with two real ugly little lumps there and there. And the only way to get rid of them is to get it in the vice and rasp it. Uh, and in a competition or any time, rasping is really physical and quite time consuming so you want to conserve your energy and certainly save as much time as you can. So a guy asked me to make this uh, block for him, uh, I've just made this today, when I'm making tools I might as well make 10 or 20 tools as make one so I made a bunch of these uh, and the idea is when you've got your, your block formed on the end of the corking you forge it back, if it's a square corking you forge it back with parallel with the edge of the block there, if it's a round corking you can just forge it round like that and you can get the leading edge of your corking twisted on without damaging this surface here or this surface there and that just saves you time in the in the vice because rasping is hard work and if you can cut back on it then do it. So when I'm making corkings uh, I generally try and make the corking in one heap but when I'm showing guys how to do it or if it's a different type of corking that I'm maybe not quite as used to as normal corking I always have two heaps and what I'll try and get on my first seat is a nice square block like that, it's slightly rectangular but it's a hunter corking so it's not too important at the moment. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll get another heat on it and I'll just show you how the uh, tooling block works. So normally once I've got that square block on the end, I'd twist it like that, or parallel with the anvil like that, and that would put a set on the uh, lead edge of the corking, and I'd knock my frog check off, knock that outside edge off. Um, but the most important thing to remember is whatever surface you hit, so if I hit that surface, that distance from there to there will grow. If I hit that surface, that distance from there to there will stretch, you know, so it'll get longer. What you want to end up with is a corking 
uh, it's hard to cork it so the back will be round but you want that distance from there to there to be exactly the same as that distance from there to there uh, and if it's going to be a square cork in that edge should be parallel with that edge at all times but this is going to be round on the back edge so it's not too important to be too worried about the back at the moment so I'll go into the block there that's putting the set on that I need that's twisted it and then with the uh, branch of the shoe flat on the anvil a lot of guys that I see recently lifting the hands up like that but that back edge should be quite straight there so leave it flat on the anvil frog check off level it up keep your frog check parallel on the anvil and lift your hand up your strong hand flop that back edge down and this is uh, a hunter corking so if it was a uh, roadster corking it'd be more rectangular that way this is a hunter corking so it's going to be more sort of rectangular that way, longer and narrower. So at the moment, that distance from there to there is a lot longer than that distance from there to there, so I need to forge the outside edge more. And then, looking out now, the leading edge there is a bit too rounded, so I'll get it back in my block and get that squared up. That's quite a nice little corking. Uh, I'll get it in the vice there and I'll just rasp the back edge up just to round it up. So that's it, it's been in the uh, vice, had a little rasp up. I haven't fast around with it too much. But what I do have is I have uh, I use these Bastily 50 rasps. I really like them, especially for feet because they're so wide you get feet flat with them. And they've got a finished side on them there, so that hasn't actually been filed, that's just been finished with the uh, smooth side of the Bastily rasp. That's why I use them, I like them. What I have done on it is for cork and wedges, I get it on the grinder. I'll grind that side off and grind that side off so I can get into that leading edge of the cork in there and pull it right back and clean it up and crisp it up without marking this part of the section there. Uh, it's not, it works well on the corking but when you get to the wedge on the other side it makes a huge difference. You can get right into that leading edge of the wedge and tidy it up nicely without marking your section. So next I've turned my block around. It started as you remember with the yellow face facing away from me so I now I've turned it around. I'm going to make the wedge. I'm just going to set down round about Let's do it that way. Just under an inch, seven eighths of an inch over the edge, which is about uh, about 24, 25 mil. Uh, just like the cork, I'm going to set that in there, and then I'm going to work it back up to the middle of the branch. I'm going to make sure I get that set in properly, fully, so that I'm not moving about as I'm uh, knocking it in. Where to leave that? Seven eighths of an inch under there. With the wedge, see how I've got that set in there. Fully set in without moving it, and then I'll work up the branch there. But that seems an excessive amount of steel for a wedge. But with the wedge, it's always good to have too much steel. For the simple reason, if you don't have enough steel, you get a real weak heel. And uh, anybody that puts any cork and wedges on knows the heels are the key feature, and they've got to be strong because if not, they just wear out in no time. But if it turns out it's massively oversized, you just get your half round cutter on. Once you forge it up, just chop the back edge off. So I've knocked that through the block now. I've left my uh, 7 8 an inch at the end there and set it down, run it all the way through. So it's flush into the block. It's not set up proud. There's no point in me spending ages making a really nice little section in there if people are only tooling it in that deep. Tool it in full depth, and then you guarantee every section you make, every shoe you'll make, will end up with the same section rather than one time you do it and you've got one millimetre stuck up and the next time you've got one and a half millimetre stuck up. It makes it a bit too random. So I've tried to make it as foolproof as you can. Knock it into the box so it's flush across the top. Make sure all your tools are held up 90 degrees to your section uh, so it won't go wrong. It's that simple. It takes a lot of the, the risk out of tool and following. Some guys um, really don't like tool and following. It can all look really great one minute and then the next minute it's all gone completely wrong. But I've tried to simplify it as much as I possibly can. So what I'm going to do now is, uh, I'm not going to be able to film it because I need the uh, striker to put this big sledgehammer on the top there. Um, on an angle, not flat on the block, but on an angle like that. So I'm going to lift my hand up, the sledgehammer's going to go on an angle like that, so it's flush onto my steel. And I'm going to forge up at an angle like that. It's really unnatural and really feels really weird. And, uh, but competitions, you see most guys doing it with the steel flat in the block, 
and then forge it straight back. But with a wedge, what you're trying to do is you have a sloping edge on the front, which corresponds to a sloping edge on the back. So obviously to do that, you've got to lift your hand up a little bit, sledgehammer on it to hold it in place, and forge upwards like that. And then you'll end up with a, a nice, like a mountain shaped slope. What tends to happen is, because you're hammering on this back surface there, obviously like I said with the corking, the surface that you forge with the hammer stretches more than the surface that's been either in the block or on the uh, edge of the anvil. So what you'll end up with is quite often you'll have a slope and it'll slope up. So the back edge there will be a lot higher. So it'll come up to a high point there. So then you've got to forge it down uh, and forge it over exaggerated to the lowest point, which will be the lowest point will be the front of the cork, front of the wedge there and then squash it back down to that lowest point. So at some point my, my corking is going to look, my wedge sorry, is going to look like be about that tall and then it'll just drop down and then it'll have a flat bit. It'll look like that. Which scares a lot of people. They get to that point and they've got a thing there that's like a, a church almost. But you've got to forge it up so the lowest point of your wedge is at the right height. So it's going to look massively tall and then squash it back down. And you'll see it when I do it. So I've backed that up and like I said before, the surface that I was hitting, that surface is obviously now a lot higher than that leading leading edge of the wedge. So I said that was what's going to happen. Uh, this is where a lot of people panic because I said there, this back edge now is massively longer, but this lowest point there, you've got to stretch it up that way so that the lowest point's at the right height for your corking, so you can get back on there and forge that down and bring it all back to your lowest point. So it still needs to be a little bit higher. So we'll get a nice little shape on it like that and then it's back into the fire and uh, I'll just rasp the shape into it that I wanted. Um, I personally like a almost like a, a teardrop shaped wedge. So that's the back of it like that and that's the front of it. So it's a little bit narrower at the back than it is at the front. So this is why I take these, uh, these two edges off these. If you have a a sharp edge on there and you start trying to rasp the leading edge of your wedge it ends up putting a mark in your section there so it's just a handy little tip so you can get that leading edge of your wedge looking real smart without wrecking your section so that's my finished wedge the back edge slopes at the same angle as the front edge there uh, I've got that teardrop shape that uh, well I just like it I think it looks smart and uh, they work well and they're practical so that's my total point of section with both the heels on it now. Uh, it's up to you whether you um, measure it and um, centre dot it. Personally on a back shim, generally in competition, I'll just uh, bend it, do it by eye. But that's turned out as 13 inches from 10 and a half inches. Someone was asking me why I put long stems on these. Some of these tooling blocks that you can buy now, they have tiny little stems on them. But Quite often when you're making a lot of shoes, like this piece of lead now, will it may be on its uh, fourth or fifth possible shoe. So it tends to get, it gets forged into the uh, the hole of the anvil. So I put a slightly longer stem on, so if it does ever get stuck, just get it underneath of it and knock it out. It's not quite as delicate as uh, a concave section. So when you're forging it, you just got to always be really careful that it doesn't twist and that you don't lose your foot bearing surface. As soon as it starts twisting, you've got to either pull your foot bearing surface back down that way or push it down that way. But always maintain the foot bearing surface, don't let it twist. And as soon as it does start twisting, get on it and fix it.
yeah, I'm losing my foot bearing surface there. It's, it's dropping down that way. Uh, best way to get that, push it back down. But just don't let it get away from you. If it goes too far, it's hard or almost impossible to get it back. So that's my hind toe bend. It's a hunter shoe, so uh, obviously the outside branch is going to be a little bit longer than the inside branch. I always use these, uh, the back edge and the leading edge of the anvil for balancing uh, shoes up. Sharp piece of chalk. And mark it with a guide fuller. As long as your guide fuller is leaned up at 90 degrees to your anvil, not one way or the other, and you put it on that stop there and that's pushed flush up against the shoe, it's going to be in the right place. see guys at competitions that are having to lean fullers over one way or the other um, although it will work sometimes it won't work all the time but it's easier if you just know that all your tools work the same they all work at 90 degrees the angle so the section that I've got when you put it through the tooling block it actually makes a flat surface on the top there so effectively you've got a flat surface another flat surface and another flat surface none of it's rounded what you need with tool of fullering is for this flat surface there, this corner of the top edge to be slightly lower than that corner. The reason for this is once you put your line down up with your guide fuller and you split it, when you go in with your fuller for your final run down, it pushes the outside edge out, which pushing it out also makes it go a little bit lower. If you can imagine it's like that, when it goes out it gets a little bit lower. So if this edge here is the same or lower than that edge there to start with, when you fuller it, it becomes really low. Uh, probably one of the most frequent mistakes you see in uh, guys when they're learning. They forget that when they're forging it, they're always forging with the, the hammer parallel to the anvil. And when they're fullering it, they've always got to forge with the hammer just leaned over just slightly. So they're always maintaining this slightly lower edge there. But all oh, it's something very important. You must do it all the time with tool and fuller shoes. Any area that's been fullered, never forge it flat. You should always forge it slightly lower on that inside edge there until you get your, your fuller in there and push that outside edge out. And then it becomes level. So these are all set up, my block set up to work with all of my tools easily, you know, everything works as long as it's in at 90 degrees to the anvil, not leaned over. Uh, and if you've got a striker, when you're making these shoes, you can just get right down like that and you can always guarantee that you're always at 90 degrees. And then you're pretty much, unless something drastically goes wrong, guaranteed to end up with a nice shoe. So the most important thing with the guy fuller is that edge there is pushed firm against the shoe and it's up at 90 degrees and you just walk it along take your time go real slow with it with it until you get good at it and then you start getting faster and then you go in with your splitter the splitter is just a, a really skinny version of a fuller the idea of the splitter is this is the hunter fuller which is a skinny version of a roadster fuller effectively the idea of the splitter is it, you can get your fuller into full depth really quickly because it's really sharp and it doesn't cause hardly any trauma to the shoe it doesn't open it up but it gets the the crease in the fuller in to the full depth then you can Take your shoe to the bit, bend it over the bit, finish your fullering off once it's bent with the fuller, which just opens it up to the right size for the head of the nail that you're using. And they're all designed to work with the, the tooling block. It's just sort of made it less uh, foolproof, more foolproof, sorry, more foolproof. And uh, a lot of the tooling sections where you, you tool your shoe, tool your shoe, you steal through, and then you see guys leaning it over. And then they've got to go in with the, the splitter, and they've got to lean the splitter over. And they go in with the guide with the fuller and they've got to lean it over. Sometimes you see them, one's leaned that way, then the splitter's leaned that way, and then the fuller's in a different angle again. It just makes it, for me, overcomplicated. I just like to keep things really simple. So the first job, I'm just going to run down this top edge with the hammer leaned over, just very fractionally, just to make sure it's nice and smooth on top. And on with the guide fuller paying huge attention to keeping it at 90 degrees to my anvil. It's much easier when you do have a striker for this because you can get right down, bend your knees, get right down and keep an eye on exactly what angle your fuller and splitter are at. Make sure I find my stop. So 
the crease that I put in the shoe now is actually at the, the correct depth. But the, you see it's only opened up wide enough to probably maybe get a city head nail in there at the moment. But what it means is it hasn't blown my section out. So I can go around the bench with my next heat, put that quarter in without worrying about closing the fluorine up. Once it's bent, I get the hunter fuller in and just nicely finish it off. So like I said before, just be really careful with it, avoid getting around the bit, and as soon as it twists and you start losing your uh, foot bearing surface, get it leveled up again, keep your section flat, maintain your, your section as best you can all the time. So that's bent round, all I've got to do now is open the, the crease up made with the splitter, just open it up with the uh, hunter fuller. Use my tool and fuller stamp. Tool and fuller stamp, similar to a, a standard stamp. The only difference being, you see how the profile is slightly different there. This means it can get in without uh, upsetting your, your section too much. If you use a normal concave stamp, it'll work. And it'll work pretty well. There's a good chance you'll end up with a little blip there, and a little blip there, and a little blip there, either on the inside edge or the outside edge. Just had a little bit of nail stuck in there. So if I balance my shoe up now, you see where the start of the fluorine is there on the inside. So they're balanced up, and that leading edge of the corking, it pretty much balanced up, so that's what I look for in a corking wedge. That that line there should be parallel with that leading edge of the corking line there. It's a tiny little feature, but the little features win competitions, so it's a little feature too, it's quite important. So I'm just going to uh, use the guide fuller and the split on the inside branch. I'm just going to run down from the start of the fullering, just to make sure that inside edge is slightly lower than the outside edge of the top surface of the shoe. When you're working on your own, just make sure your shoes level all the time. As it starts twisting around when you're looking to in, you tend to end up following in the wrong place if you're not careful. I think that's well, it's one of my favourite shoes. I love tour following, but I think the amount of work that goes into making these sections before you even start making a shoe, I think that puts a lot of people off. You've got to do a hell of a lot of work, uh, and if your tools aren't set up right, it can all just go so wrong so quickly, and it can become very disheartening. So that's the inside edge mark, so I'll just bring it out, bend it round a bit, and nail all it. So I'm just going to follow the inside branch, I've run down it with a guide fuller, so I'm not going to need that again now, so I'm just going to put that out of the way. Same with the splitter. Keep the toilet table as empty as you can. When I'm working, the stuff I'm using I keep there, the stuff I'm not using I'll put in the you know, little holes there. Um, you won't believe the amount of time it does save you in a long competition like if you've got an hour, an hour and fifteen not minutes long competition, not having to look for tools on a cluttered tool table just saves so much time. So as you can say, just uh, losing my foot bearing surface, it's sloping off at an angle like that, so I'll just bring it back. Don't let it get too far. This is quite a I'm gonna probably have to have another little heat just to show you. Uh, just finish this branch off. But on the inside edge there, I've lost my foot bearing surface there a little bit. The whole branch has leaned over. And, uh, I had a guy in for a clinic, well, I went to his forge actually about a week ago, and he kept doing the same thing. And then he was struggling to get it back down. He was trying to hit it in there to push that inside edge down. The uh, best way of doing it, get it on the back and just forge your corking over. Two hits, look, and I've got my foot bearing surface back there. Looks like I've still probably got enough heat, I'll just get that finished off.
So anyways, it's roughed out at the moment. Um, I'll get another heat on it, or I'll get a couple more heats on it probably at some point in time. Just tidy it up with a rasp and the file. But that's just knocked out, nice and quick, nice and easy. Uh, all the nail holes are in the right place. Um, it's taken a lot of the guesswork out of the, the tool and funnel in, in my opinion. Uh, hopefully more people will be willing to give it a go, because personally I love it, I think it's a great foraging exercise. Let's put a, yeah, a cross page clip on this. Now a long way from being the world's best cross page clipper. That certainly got a lot better with this hammer, because the bulk of the weight's on the cross plane end. And it just makes it much easier, in my opinion, to uh, get it to land correctly. instead of a pose of heel is it's a thicker part of the handle and it takes a lot of the vibration out and hopefully keeps the shoe fractionally more still. One of the things to remember with the concave seal, whether it's a tuna fuller section like this or a concave section, when you're facing your clipping, don't have it on 90 degrees on your bit. Lean it over so this slope is like that on the uh, anvil, and then the anvil's not just on that sharp edge there. So that's it. Nice and simple. I mean, I could always used to be a terrible cross paint clipper, but. Building the cross pane, it's been out for a long time now, but it's got such a bulk of weight in the, uh, the actual cross pane end, it makes it so much easier to use. <laughs>